What would you do if your doctor told you that you only had three months to live? Would you waste this time bemoaning your fate? Would you give yourself over to pain and despair? Or would you resolve to live each moment of those three months in a deep way? If you do that, three months of life is a lot. Some 20 years ago, a young man came to me and told me exactly this, that he had had only three months to live. I asked him to sit down with me and have a cup of tea. My friend, I said to him, you must drink this tea in such a way that life is possible. We must live this moment we have together in a deep way. One day is a lot. A picnic lasts only half a day, but you can live it fully with a lot of happiness. So why not three months? Your life is a kind of picnic and you should arrange it intelligently. Someone I knew once said to his Buddhist teacher, Master, I would like to go on a picnic with you. The teacher was very busy, so he replied, Sure, sure, we'll go on a picnic one of these days. Time went by, and five years later, they still hadn't had the picnic. One day, the master and the disciple were on some business together and they found themselves caught in a traffic jam. There were so many people in the street that the master asked the disciple, what are all these people doing? The disciple saw that it was a funeral procession. He turned to the master and said, they're having a picnic. Don't wait to start living, live now. Your life should be real in this very moment. If you live like that, three months is a lot. You can live every moment of every day deeply in touch with the wonders of life. Then you will learn to live and at the same time learn to die. A person who does not know how to die does not know how to live, and vice versa. You should learn to die, to die immediately. This is a practice. I didn't realize it was that heavy <laughs> until you read it. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. That was great. So our scripture text today, our scripture text today, from the gentle and wise teacher of Buddhism, Thich Nhat Hanh, reminds me of a song I loved um, several years ago. I still love it today. It's a country song. <laughs> not with a funny title, not this one. Country song written by Tim McGraw about a man who went to the doctor and found out that he only had a short time to live. The words, many of you might know them. If you want, you can sing them with me if you want. <laughs> <laughs> the words go something like, I was in my, I'm not going to sing it, so I'm not going to try and do my best Tim McGraw. I was in my early 40s. No, that's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a hat on. I need a cowboy hat to do by Tim McGraw. I was in my early 40s with a whole lot of life before me when a moment came that stopped me on a dime. I spent most of the next days looking at the x-rays and talking about options and talking about dear old time. Someone in the song then asked the man in his 40s, um, who obviously was just told he only had a short 
time to live. He, he said, what, what did you do when you received the news that your life was coming to an end? And the man answers with the refrain of the song. Again, I'm not going to sing it to you, but I know you. many of you know it. He, what did he do? He went skydiving. He went Rocky Mountain climbing, right? He went 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. <laughs> um, and he loved deeper. And he spoke sweeter. Um, and he gave forgiveness he'd been denying. That's the refrain of the song. And the refrain ends with, um, Someday I hope you get the chance to live like you were dying. Someday I hope you get the chance to live like you were dying. Now faced with the reality, at the end of his life, the man did these things he ordinarily maybe would not have done, things he could not anymore put off because he only had three months for another day or maybe even things he was too afraid to try, you know, because he clung, he was clinging to the fragile nature of life before his, his diagnosis. And, and he also, he did some other things with his time fleeting in his life, knowing that death was imminent. He became a better husband. Huh. And he became a better friend, the song tells us. And, and he went fishing more, you know? <laughs> and he stopped to watch the eagle soar sky high above him in the sky. And in the end, the refrain just plays over and over, almost just haunting. I, someday I hope you get the chance to live like you're dying. I hope you get, I hope uh, to live like you're dying, to live like you're dying to live like you're dying. I hope you get the chance to live like you're dying. For country song, I'd say that's pretty dang powerful, right? Mm -hmm. It's nothing about trucks or dirt, <laughs> guns. <laughs> it's not only a really powerful song, but it was wildly popular, that song. Wildly, off the charts popular. It was like old Tim McGraw had struck something deep within those who had heard his song that went beyond its catchy, kind of fun melody. It had a message that resonated deep in people's souls and their weary, busy, worried, God, minds, bodies, and spirits, and reminded them life so often is just passing us by. You know, as we go through the motions and fill our relatively short time here on earth with a lot of clutter, Huh, and a lot of things to worry about and to stress over. His song struck a chord among the weary that there has to be a better way to live that is not so fleeting, perhaps, but rather a way to live in which we are filled with awe and passion and adventure in some form that's comfortable with us. You don't all have to ride a bull named Fu Manchu. <laughs> and the freedom to live beyond the confines of the boundaries that are all too often set for us to define our lives. His character in the song faced, faced imminent death, and he began to live, maybe for the first time. Maybe for the first time. And life for him took on a, a whole new level of freedom, maybe in beauty and wonder, even as he faced death, maybe because he faced death. And he then packed more into those final weeks or months than he ever packed into the previous 40 years of his life. And in the end, in the end of it, looking back, he wished perhaps he'd lived that way all along. Hmm. But it took the realization of his finitude and that life would soon end for him to find the courage, the courage to actually live. I see why so many related to his words. For so many of us are seeking all well, the same thing in our own lives, right? Maybe the chance to live with freedom and abandon and maybe the courage to finally grasp life for what we want it to be, right? Maybe rather than what we are told that it should entail. So I guess for me, someday I hope that we all get the chance to live like we were dying. Our story from Thich Nhat Hanh, our recently deceased Buddhist master, one of the wisest and most profound spiritual leaders of the last 2,000 years is very much the same, though instead of a country song, I'm not sure Thich Nhat Hanh is the biggest country fan, but who knows? <laughs> he surprises people in many levels. His comes from the heart 
of one of the world's great religious traditions in Buddhism. And in the story we heard, Thich Nhat Hanh tries to, he tries to get listeners to, to wake up to life, to see that the time we have is precious every single moment. And then he calls on us to live it as if that were actually the case, if that were so. And I'm guessing if you ask most people if time is, is precious, nobody like, they'll nod their heads. Yeah, I agree with you. Time is precious. I agree with your statement. Of course it is. But ask them if they live that way. Ask them if they live like time is precious and you'll more than often get maybe a blank stare or a hurried response before they tell you they have to go run off to this or that <laughs> engagement in their busy, busy lives. Huh. Our gentle Buddhist monk is saying, don't live that way. Don't live like that. Live like you're going to live forever. Or don't live like you're going to live forever, believing surely that you have all the precious time in the world at your disposal. Rather, live like you have a day or a week or maybe a, a month or, in this case of our song, three months. And life will look really different to you, really different. That is central teaching and component to, to Buddhism and is the very antithesis, I will say, of the religion that most of us have lived our lives under. Christianity and its Bible-based way of life, where the focus is often, so often not on the here and now, but on the future, right? Or better said, the future beyond our earthly future. The next future, the heavenly future. But Buddhism, and in particular the ways of this, of this gentle monk practitioner of it, says no, 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 no. Focus on the here and now as though that's all you got. And live it as though what you got is only a short span of time. And then ask yourself, what would you do? What would you do? What would you do? What have you been missing? And if you were like that young man sipping tea in his office that he talked about, how would you live those remaining days? If you have three months, Thich Nhat Hanh is asking, shouldn't the tea taste a little bit different? And why can't we live that, that way all the time? Why only then? I want you to hang on to that question and that thought, because um, we're going to return to that with a little exercise in just a bit. What would you do if you found out you only had three months left to live? Hang on to that thought. As morbid as it is. But let's do it in the philosophical sense, right? <laughs> but it's not necessarily philosophical in Buddhism. It's real. It's real. But first, as we look beyond the Bible, and yes, even beyond our tradition for this, this short sermon series, attempting to glean some wisdom from other spiritual ways, let me briefly explore the question of how can a general knowledge of Buddhism enhance our lives as Christians? How can a general knowledge of Buddhism enhance our lives as Christians? For I believe not only can it do so in powerful ways, but that the, the similarities between Jesus and Buddha, oh my God, they're remarkably striking. And before looking at those, um, let's just explore a bit, around, a bit of the background of, of Buddhism, which traces its origins to the life of a man and right around the 6th century BCE, a rich young man named Siddhartha Gautama. Now, Siddhartha, at a fairly young age, became quite conscious of his privileged place in society and his family's incredibly great wealth, and he began to grow, like, really unimpressed with it all, unimpressed with all his wealth. He sensed that there was something more than just the comfort of his lifestyle, and he decided to do something about it. So kind of like St. Francis later on, he gave it all up. He gave up all that wealth. He walked away and he became a poor monk, wandering in the surrounding areas, begging for food. And legend says he often lived on, get this, one single grain of rice per day. Whew, filling. <laughs> he soon realized, though, just as the wealthy lifestyle did not suit him in his seeking, neither did this militant asceticism. That also didn't suit him. So he began to practice what is called the middle path, or a way of life that... Of, of neither extravagance on the one end or extreme poverty 
On the other, he rejected them both and saw the life lived with balance in between those extremes. God, if only we could do that politically in this country. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> Say that for another sermon. After finding this middle path and through continued seeking, Siddhartha found his way to the Bodhi tree. You've all heard of the Bodhi tree where he sat underneath its branches or its leafiness, whatever it has. And, and, and some schools of thought say as he sat there, he was tempted. Does that sound familiar? By the allure of women. Oh, it's always women come tempting. Well, if it's a woman, would men come to the tempting? <laughs> to find those scriptures. <laughs> so, this, so these women come and they're doing their thing and they're trying to move him. And, and then he's tempted by power. And he's tempted with fear. So something's going to destroy him. But he never gives in. Eventually, Siddhartha goes on, beats all of this and experiences what we call enlightenment. And Siddhartha goes on and becomes known as the Buddha, which means the word the enlightened one. And then he set off on a path. He went on to teach others how they too can find enlightenment and can find liberation in their own lives and eventually obtain enlightenment on their own. He died around the year 480 BCE and his teachings were carried on by his followers and passed down today where there are three main schools of Buddhism with many more as we know, just like Christianity, right? Many more underneath that that vary greatly from one another and squabble about who has the true teachings. Again, it all just sounds so familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> if only there was some motif we could examine here. <laughs> and what does Buddhism teach? Well, like our own denominations of Christianity, again, that depends on who you're asking. But generally, they all revolve around the idea of what's called the Four Noble Truths. And that first truth is that there is suffering. We all know it, right? There's suffering in our lives and in the world. That's a fact. The second, there's always a cause for that suffering. And generally, it's our own attachments and our own vices and desires that causes that suffering. Number three is that we can overcome that suffering by letting go of our desires and attachments. <laughs> well, that sounds easy, doesn't it? <laughs> Whew. Buddhism's tougher than Christianity, for God's sakes. <laughs> and fourth, lastly, that to truly overcome the suffering in our lives, in the world, we must live a certain way, which he went on to develop as the eightfold path of rights. Right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right, and this one's a big one for me this day, mindfulness, right mindfulness, and finally, right concentration. I'm not going to go into all of those, but if you're interested in learning more, see me after the service. And as I always love to do, I'll point you to some good books <laughs> so you can, you can learn more. I don't know about you, but I, I don't know. I find within Buddhism a, a great deal of meaning in how to live life as though it's a spiritual practice. You see that too a little bit? It's like a path. It's a path to... To walk in life um, on the spiritual journey to transform my own ways. That's how I see it in my own life and really of myself for the sake of the world and for others. Rather than, and this is how we've been kind of indoctrinated, than a set of beliefs, right? That I need to assent to. That's what Christianity so often teaches. For the sake of only myself and my salvation. Not in this life, but in the next promised life. So much of... Christian, the Christian tradition can so often, I know I'm going to say this and I don't want to offend any, but it can be such a selfish endeavor. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? It can be a selfish endeavor, especially when mingled in with end times and predestination beliefs where some will be saved for the glories of the next life and poor other suckers won't be. They'll be left behind like in those movies with the airplane flying and the pilot disappears because he's been raptured because apparently he was one of the chosen that's going to go to heaven and the rest just crash into a fiery death on the earth below. I know that's a series, but come on. Let's, it's there. The core of it's there in the, in the teachings. <laughs> so the goal of so much of personal Christianity is, is it's too personal for me. And not necessarily communal, as we see expressed so often in, in Buddhism. It hasn't always been that way. I just want to say, 
Far from it, but that is how it's often presented today. But by going beyond the Bibles, we're doing in this series and studying other religions like Buddhism this week, outside of our own tradition, um, kind of allows us to have a little window in, right? Into our own tradition and see a little more clearly. We can kind of critique it, and that's okay to do that in a way that we might not necessarily do if we're just living it and we're kind of going through the motions. And that's how I was struck this week by the similarities between uh, Buddha and Jesus. I mean, it's, it's, it's really crazy. Um, let me back up. It struck us by the recognition of just how much the earliest and purest form, this is where I want to go, of Christianity shared with the earliest form of Buddhism. They're actually really similar in how the lives of Buddha and Jesus were uh, just so similar. Um, I mean, Jesus was born poor. Okay, we know that, right? Buddha, Siddhartha was born rich, but they both came early on to see the folly of it all and that attachments and accumulation to material things just didn't really matter. That's a huge similarity between them. Siddhartha practiced non-attachment through his denial of accumulation of material wealth. And Jesus did as well, saying things like, do you remember when he said, hey, go and sell all that you own and give all that money to the poor? Do you remember when he said that? And then go ahead and come and follow me. So he was very much the same. Siddhartha believed in alleviating the suffering of all people through love and compassion based on that eightfold path. Jesus told people to love their neighbors just as they love themselves. And he told great stories like the Good Samaritan to remind us how that is central to his way. Strong similarities between them. Um, Siddhartha was tempted under the Bodhi tree. That's what I already said. It emerged transformed with a way of liberation for all people. And Jesus emerged from the temptation in the wilderness and began to walk a way of liberation for all people. Another similarity. Siddhartha found in meditation that he could center himself in enlightenment, and Jesus went off in prayer so often to ground himself in the enlightened reality that he called God, or Abba, in many cases, Abun. Finally, and there are other similar, there's so many similarities we could explore between them, but Siddhartha built into the fabric of his way of enlightenment the idea of mindfulness, of paying deep attention to the depth of each and every moment. While Jesus reminded people so often of the same thing and to pay attention to the birds of the air, right? Or to notice those flowers in the field. Don't miss them, he says. Or the sacred nature of a shared meal or the preciousness of a moment shared with others. Hmm. Both of their ways are about paying attention to the world around you. Each moment, each experience, each person and the simplest and most ordinary of moments. And for Buddha, there's a lifetime in an hour and transformation in a moment stolen under a tree. And for Jesus, the infinite is contained in a simple story. And transformation, likewise, is something as simple as a fig tree, Wendy's favorite, or a mustard seed. They just saw differently, didn't they? They both were radical for their times, and they called us to live really different kinds of lives then, and they they still do today. And mindfulness, being in the moment, was the key that linked them both. I think we've lost that today in Christianity, sadly. The great myth master Joseph Campbell once said, people is a quote, people say that what we're all seeking is a meaning in life. Do you agree with that? Sometimes. (laughs) But Campbell goes on, I don't think that's what we're really seeking. I think that what we're really seeking is an experience of being alive so that our life experiences on the purely physical plane will have resonances within our own innermost being and reality so that we actually feel the rapture of being alive. We're not seeking meaning. We're seeking the rapture of being alive. He says that's what it's all finally about, end quote. Sounds exactly what Tim McGraw, back to our country artist, <laughs> was singing about in his blockbuster song, or what Thich Nhat Hanh was expressing in his story about the young man or the master missing out on life and a picnic 
with a beloved friend because he was just too busy. Who here has been too busy a time of their life? Every hand in here should go up. Who still is too busy at times? Every hand in here, in some way or another, should go up. So the master didn't live like he was dying. And he will not do so likely until he's dead, is what Thich Nhat Hanh is saying. Only then it will be too late, and his funeral will be the only chance for the picnic. Though he will have missed it. So my question for you is, how does seeing the fleeting nature of life, as Buddhism tries to get us to, change how you choose to live? How does recognizing honestly, as Buddhism does, how finite we really are, that death is something that awaits us all, how does that change you? And how can that realization lead us deeper into living more fully in every moment of our lives? How can we begin now, in this moment, not in the future that may not exist, but now, in the here and now, to live with more rapture that Joseph Campbell was talking about, more awe, more wonder? How can we do that? You don't have to go skydiving. <laughs> you don't have to... Go Rocky Mountain climbing, and you don't have to do two-point seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. <laughs> but what does it look like for you to live like you were dying? I want you to ponder that for a second. Just think about that. Just think about it for a second. Answer Thich Nhat Hanh's question. What would you do if your doctor told that you only had three months to live? Would you waste this time bemoaning your fate? Would you give yourself over to pain and despair? Or would you resolve to live each moment of those three months in a deep way? What would you do? What would you do? And now for the exercise part of this. I don't want this to be painful. <laughs> I want you to turn to your neighbor. Someone close to you. Maybe someone you don't even know. If you've got a spouse, you know, turn away from your spouse. It's <laughs> the so one time you can do that. But it doesn't matter. Turn, turn to someone and just and, and tell them, what would you do if you were to, what would living like you were dying look like to you? What would you do if you found out you had three months? left to live. What would you do? Go ahead, just, just share, share, a, share a bit. David, what would you do? I let the cat out of the bag now, didn't I? I'm never going to get it back. <laughs> Train's going off the tracks. Let's regroup here, folks. For <laughs> our line, folks, please do the same. What would it look like for you? What would you do with your three months? All right, everybody. I went skydiving. I went 
Rocky Mountain climbing. I did 2.7 seconds on a bowling Fu Manchu. And I love deeper. And I, no, I'm done. I'm done. They got your attention. <laughs> oh my God. I ain't gonna sit down. <laughs> That's why I'm not in choir. So who wants to volunteer a quick something? What would you do? Skydive. Skydive. Seriously. Seriously. Skydive. Tell people you love them. Tell people you love them. What's that? Hot air balloon ride. <laughs> you can't go to a Green Bay game. No one goes to a Green Bay game, Jim. Oh. No! That's how you die, you go to a Green Bay game. It hastens the whole thing up. Sorry, Packer fans. Come on, Mike. You know you go to a Packers-Vikings game in Green Bay. You no. Know, any others? What would you do? Make that meet up for dinner or lunch. Just continue living my life as it is. Continue living your life as it is. Any others? Find homes for my animals. Find homes. <laughs> the practical things. <laughs> Any others? Travel. Travel. Family. Family. Galapagos Island. Galapagos Island, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Darwin. Listen more. People. Listen more. What? <laughs> <laughs> we don't listen to you now. <laughs> I'm never doing this again. <laughs> Just gonna... Great things, and I hope you'll continue sharing them. But here's my, this is what I want to say to you. All of you that said something to do in the future, what you've shared, go do it. Go do it. I want to see you on an airplane to the Galapagos Islands next week. We'll miss you. <laughs> Don't wait anymore. You all just express things you want to do. You want to love your family more. So love your family more today. You want to travel. You want to skydive. Zephyr Hills is right over there. My wife, my wife skydived there, for God's sakes. Go skydive. Don't say, well, be careful, but you know what I'm saying. You want to love deeper. You want to talk sweeter. It's Tim McGrossa. Whatever you want to do. And you, you look at doing it in the next, you know, if only you had that short time. You can do it anyways. That's... You know, the heart of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. the heart of, and really the heart of the Jesus way as well. To live in the moment with intention and rapturous joy. The very best and hearts of our religious traditions have been trying to tell us. The very best, the purest. Before Paul got involved and others got involved with it. Have been trying to tell us to live life fully. We just find other things to block that out and convince ourselves we can't. But here's the thing, you can and you should. That's Thich Nhat Hanh's message for us today. Take this into your week, my friends. Ponder it, please. Ponder it deeply. Do something new this week. It doesn't matter what it is. Something big, something small. Do something new that you've maybe been putting off for some time. Live like you were dying this week. And then let's check in next week, and I want to know how that feels and how that felt. And again, finally, don't seek the meaning in life in these things. Seek the experiences that make you come alive. And I believe if you can do that as Buddha knew and as Jesus knew, that you will stand changed. And that's the best of what our religions can give us. May you have a rapturous week of embracing the new and living like you were dying. Amen.